Hi, everybody, and welcome to Explicit Instruction for Students with Moderate to Severe Disabilities. My name is Laura Clark, and I'm one of the consultants at NKCES. And I'm excited to be sharing with you today a topic for which I am very passionate. I'm using evidence-based practices to support students with disabilities. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about how we can use explicit instruction to support students with moderate to severe disabilities. So in this training, you should have access to the Google Doc that you see over here on the right that has hyperlinks to all the resources you'll need to complete the training, <coughs> the video links for the video that you're watching right now, and then also some additional resources to explore, as well as the quiz that you'll need to take to earn your PD or ELS certificate. If you um, pass the quiz with 80% accuracy the first time, fantastic. If not, you can take the quiz as many times as you need, so no worries. And if you run into questions, you can always reach out to me. My email is at the end of the presentation and also on this Google Doc. So within the Google Doc that we just looked at, there's several resources so that if you have an idea, you can jot it down. Um, the resources on the right, there's two different ways you can access the slides that I'm showing right now. There's a three slides view with lines to take notes. There's also a one slide view. Within the training, you'll see several videos and resources, and I have hyperlinked all of those in either by a um, URL that is um, underlined with words, or you can also often click on the video pictures and it will take you right to the video resources. In addition to the handout that you see on the right, there's also the one on the left, and that one walks you through the specific elements of explicit instruction, and it's got two different columns for you to write in. Um, the column in the middle is where you could capture any supports that you're using for your students for that specific element. So if you need to add some visuals, if a picture schedule or a timer would be helpful, um, if some core vocabulary would be useful. And then on the right, there's a spot for implementation ideas. So thinking about specific ways that you could implement that step, specific content that you know you want to teach in that way. But both of those resources are available for you to use. So a lot of times when we're thinking about teaching, you know, there's a reason behind why we're doing what we're doing. And so I just wanted to share a real quick um, my why for why explicit instruction is so important. So on the bottom left, you'll see uh, my heart there at the bottom. That's my family, my husband, Dan, and our four fantastic kids. We have three daughters and a son, and Daniel has a diagnosis of autism and epilepsy. He just turned 21 um, not too long ago, and so has transitioned from school-based services to adult services. He has several waivers um, in the state of Kentucky that provide supports for him. And from the time Dan <coughs> was an infant, we've been working on um, communication and used lots and lots of explicit instruction to try and support his communication. So at the age of 21, um, we're still in early trials um, with PECS. For those of us that are familiar with PECS, um, Dan um, is still at a stage where he's trying to discriminate pictures and scan a visual field. We've moved recently to supporting him with core vocabulary. We use Proloquo to go on his iPad and also an app called Yes, No. And our youngest daughter would like to demonstrate for you how we're using the Yes, No. And we taught him how to use the Yes, No using explicit instruction. So as you can see, um, supporting Dan is a family affair and we use lots of explicit instruction to provide those supports. So as you're thinking about ways that you can use explicit instruction, 
Um, keep in mind that for every student you support, there's a family behind that student that also needs um, instruction in how to provide appropriate supports. And explicit instruction is one of those fantastic evidence-based tools that benefit us all. Throughout the presentation today, I'm going to um, be modeling what I'm talking about. And we're gonna talk a lot about the importance of embedding core vocabulary and picture supports. So for this presentation, I am using the free core vocabulary resources that are available on AssistiveWare's website in their core word classroom. I've linked those resources in here and you will see screenshots of the Proloquo or the AssistiveWare core words throughout this presentation. These images happen to match what's on Proloquo to go. In other presentations, I'll be using different core vocabulary. You should definitely use the core vocabulary and the communication devices and programs that your assistive technology team or speech and language pathologist recommend. So if you want to link in to the boards, there's a two um, page board that's linked on the prior slide. This board gives you access to a four page core word that has um, some of the folders that are at the bottom. And you'll see these images linked throughout, so you might want to have a copy printed out. So if you're following the core words at the bottom, um, what a message I might share is I like EI, which is the shortened version of explicit instruction, because it is good and it truly is good. Explicit instruction at its base is an exp explicit or systematic instructional approach that includes not just the delivery of instruction, but the design of instruction. There is a very significant evidence base behind the use of explicit instruction, not just for academic content, but also for teaching behavioral skills. You will often hear different terms used interchangeably when we're talking about explicit instruction. Sometimes you'll see direct instruction, you might see systematic instruction, but often the core components are the same. I'm gonna be focusing on explicit instruction as, as it has been defined by Anita Archer and Charles Hughes. If you haven't um, purchased or can't find a copy of the book, Explicit Instruction, I, I would highly recommend that you grab it. It is a, one of those must-haves for teachers of students with moderate to severe disabilities. If you're looking to deepen your knowledge past today's um, PD learning, there's always more, more, more. And I've linked in three fantastic sites. If you click on the images, it will take you to the websites. Um, the biggest image is for the National Center on Intensive Intervention, and they have eight different modules focusing on explicit instruction and how that content can be delivered. In addition, uh, the CEDAR Center has developed high leverage practices in conjunction with the Council for Exceptional Children. And so there are great videos and resources there that you should definitely check out. And then the bottom right, Anita has developed a website called Explicit Instruction. And she has shared with us just gift upon gift in the videos that she shared of her demonstrating explicit instruction in classrooms at the elementary and secondary level. And I watch them quite often because I learn something new every time I sit and observe her teaching. Um, it is truly one of the greatest gifts that has ever been shared to me as a teacher. And I wanted to, to pass that along to you. So before we dig really deeply into the 16 elements of explicit instruction, I wanted to take just a few minutes for us to think about our learners. So I'd like you to think about your students if you're already in the classroom and have students that you work with every day. And if you are new to teaching, then I'd like you to think about what you know about students with moderate to severe disabilities. And let's just take a few minutes to think about um, their um, characteristics and what they need to be successful in their learning. So we know often for students that qualify in Kentucky or around the United States with moderate to severe disabilities, whatever your categories are, many students often have some kind of significant medical and or physical needs. And those can include, starting with the blue circle, some underlying medical conditions. They could be taking medications that might have some interactions that would affect their alertness and their attention throughout the day. They could have what is called comorbid conditions, which means more than one. Dan has a diagnosis of autism and epilepsy, so those comorbid conditions. There might be some kind of an underlying health diagnosis, 
our mental health diagnosis that may be treated or untreated. For example, some students have depression and anxiety, and those might come on at different points in their lives. And when Dan reached puberty, we recognized some symptoms that looked to us like depression and anxiety. And so we worked with his physician to um, increase some medications that could help him uh, feel a little less anxious. We know that many of our students might have some mobility differences that might affect their gross motor or their fine motor skills. And some might have changing medical statuses throughout the year or years, um, whether that's um, some worsening conditions and some um, more significant symptoms or just um, changes in things like allergies. We also know that some students have vision and hearing loss. They might be diagnosed or undiagnosed, treated or untreated. Daniel has um, farsightedness that is in the mild range and he will not wear glasses. So his farsightedness is untreated and his teachers had to be aware of that before they started teaching to make sure that um, they were in his correct visual field. For some of our students, we know that they're gonna have some limited cognitive abilities and that can include difficulties with remembering instructions or remembering information from moment to moment, day to day and week to week. We have some students who really struggle with ignoring distractions um, and some students who really struggle with um, our prompts. So they might look like they're ignoring our prompts to get their attention, which makes a difference in instruction. Um, some students will not be able to organize information into categories without some supports from us. And they may have trouble recognizing patterns in information. They may have trouble predicting what will happen next. What do you think might happen? Some students really struggle with switching their attention between tasks. They need significant visual and verbal cues. They might need a break in between that helps them understand that transition time. They probably have some slower working memory speed and might ch be challenged to sustain their attention to a task. So we need to know how long they can attend so that we can target our lessons to be within that time frame. We've talked really briefly about students that might struggle with limited stamina and alertness. And I just wanted to go a little bit deeper into that. For those students that might have some kind of underlying medical condition, they might have challenges with their gross motor, with their core muscles. So they might really have trouble with stamina, whether that's for sitting, for walking, for standing, and might need really significant support. So you'll wanna work carefully and closely with your team, with your OTs and your PTs, to make sure that we're really supporting the student's core and that we know about how long we should be using any positioning tools and what the student's um, need for movement is. Some students might really struggle with providing attention to task, especially if they're taking some kind of a medication that might impact their alertness throughout the day. Some students are really gonna have limited fine motor stamina, so requiring activities like cutting, writing, placing items, pointing, um, even visually attending to tasks, depending on their diagnosis. For example, students with cortical visual impairments might really struggle with um, visual stimuli. Students with autism also might struggle with too much visual stimuli. So again, we're gonna wanna work with the experts that know these conditions best to make sure that we're targeting instruction appropriately. We might have kids that really struggle with their attention for listening, and they might need very specific conditions like decreased noise around the classroom. They might also have limited alert time, whether that's where they're physically awake because of their seizure status, because of the medications they're taking. But we need to know all of that information so that we are maximizing instructional time um, for those times when our students are most alert and have the most stamina. For those students that have limited communication, um, whether that's limited functional communication, and that could be some deficits in their expressive skills and how they're able to tell us their wants and needs or their receptive skills and understanding verbal language. We need to know exactly where their deficits and their skills are so that we can target our instruction. The other thing at the bottom right, you'll notice that many of our students, especially students with autism, might have trouble with what we call limited joint attention. And limited joint attention, that joint attention means 
that you're paying attention to both an object and each other. So for example, when I hold up a letter card and I say, look, this is the letter A, then many students will look at the letter and we'll have a conversation about A. But for students with autism, some students on the spectrum um, don't have a joint attention skills yet. And so that can really impact their ability to attend to the learning. And we need to be aware of where our students are in that continuum. When you're thinking about what should you teach, you know, our first go to is usually our academic content. So reading, writing, math, social studies, science, the humanities. But for students with moderate to severe disabilities who also need instruction across daily living skills, social engagement and communication, and developing leisure activities, all of these areas are perfect for using the steps in explicit instruction. So as we move through the 16 steps, I'd like you to keep in mind that whole child philosophy and make sure that we're really thinking through every way that we need to be providing support to our students and our students' families, and how can we use those explicit instruction elements. We're going to talk about communication quite a good bit as we move through the 16 elements. So I wanted to take just a second to make sure that we're thinking about where all of our students are on the continuum of their communication skills and not just what are they using. So for example, students that might be completely independently verbal or students that are using a dynamic display and an eye gaze on an AAC, no matter where they are on that continuum. We also have to think about how accurate our students are, how independent they are, how much prompting they require, and if they're able to use that communication across settings and across time. For our students that use AAC, it's super important that we make sure that not just we, the teacher and the speech and language pathologist, understand how to use that AAC and how to program that AAC at our house, all of our children know how to program Dan's AAC. We continue to work on learning new tricks and new ways to add vocabulary and change background colors to support Dan. Um, we wanna make sure that everyone that works with a student knows how to use that AAC and doesn't ever forget that AAC. It's really um, easy to fall into the trap of saying, I showed them that device and they never use that. They don't know how to use it. And you have to think of it like when we're developing a language uh, with very, very young children where we model, model, model. Look at the flower, see the pretty flower, the flower, the flower, the flower. We say it about 500 times until the child looks at us and we're like, yes, yes, it's a flower. And before the child ever says flower, they might be saying f and rrr and flu and blah and all different sounds and not really getting to the right sound. And you say, nope, it's not a ball, it's a flower. It's the same way with the AAC. All students should have the opportunity to do what we call babbling, which is just practicing pushing buttons and seeing what those buttons say. And we also need to be seen demonstrating how to use that AAC. So we as a teacher can model it over and over again, and we can have our students using that core vocabulary. So the four pages that I showed you in the beginning are really easy to print out and give to every student in a classroom so that when we're talking together, we're using those pictures and modeling that speech for each other. When we talk about the power of AAC, I wanted to share with you some videos I found recently. This is Mrs. Campbell, and Mrs. Campbell kindly shared on YouTube a variety of videos on her YouTube channel. And these are two of my favorites. Mrs. Campbell makes pizza and Mrs. Campbell makes a bear snack. We're gonna take a quick look at Mrs. Campbell makes pizza. Um, not necessarily to get through the steps of pizza, although she does a great job of teaching that, but I wanted to show you how she really incorporates um, the picture schedules and AAC into what she's doing and makes that a part of her everyday speech and routine. So let's take a few minutes and watch Mrs. Campbell. Hi guys, I'm back. I wanted to join you this evening uh, to take some time to make dinner together. 
we're going to make pizza. And so I want to start with our schedule. And this is always a great way to get going with anything so you know what the plan is for our activity. First, we're going to cook. Then we're going to have some choice time while the food is in the oven. And then we're going to eat and play outside. First cook, then have some choice time while it cooks. And then we're gonna eat and play outside. We're making pizza. So before we do our cooking project, I wanted to get us started with a healthy habit. And this healthy habit is something we should do anytime we cook or anytime we eat. And we should be doing it a lot right now anyway. Um, the thing we're going to do is an action body. We're going to wash and then we're going to go to things, body parts. And if you hold down right here on hands, you can make it plural. Wash hands. We're going to wash our hands. Before we do that, I'm going to get this fancy electronics cleaning wipe. And what I want to do is take a quick second and wipe down my AAC device. Because you should have your device with you everywhere. And that means that if you're talking a lot and taking your device all over your house, it just like your cell phone or any other part of you, it can get dirty. So we need to take an opportunity and wipe that down when we're washing our hands or at least once a day. Make sure it stays clean. So thanks to Mrs. Campbell for sharing her videos on YouTube and for that fantastic reminder that we can incorporate our AAC modeling every day, all day long. When we're thinking about explicit instruction, we also need to think about the power of prompts and where our students are in the need for prompts. So some students are going to be completely independent and require very few prompts, maybe some visual prompts, some pointing, um, or maybe some positional prompts in how we arrange materials. Other students are going to require some hand over hand prompting and supports. Wherever students are, there's a few things we want to think about with prompting. Um, one is that we are using the least invasive prompts that the student requires. And the second is that we're fading as quickly as possible. So a student might start with a full physical hand over hand prompt for cutting, but very quickly we could fade back to a partial physical prompt and prompting at the wrist first and then moving back to the elbow to provide some support. We might be doing tons of modeling and I hope we are, with using things like aided language stimulation or where you're doing what this student is supposed to do. Definitely part of our I do, we do, you do steps with an explicit instruction. We might be using lots of gestures and cues like nodding and pointing. And we might be giving all different kinds of verbal prompts. So you may be working on errorless learning. So we're just directly giving the student the answer. Or maybe we're giving them a hint. You know, the item is round and it is red and it is in the classroom on the table. You're right, it's a ball, right? Those indirect hints. We might be giving the student the entire answer or a part of the answer. Maybe we're starting the sound. It's a b, b, and hoping the student says ball. Yes, you're right, it's a ball. But making sure we're using those level of prompts wisely and that we're really utilizing what I like to call the power of a pause. We want to give students time to think and to know the answer and to say the answer um, verbally with their AAC device with an eye gaze. The power of a pause can mean the difference between students gaining independence and developing learned helplessness and prompt dependency. So you really want to know where your student is cognitively so you know how long to wait for their response. We also want to think about the cues that we are giving. So those attentional cues are things we're doing to get the student's attention. So maybe it's a sound that we play. Maybe it's a words like eyes on me, or maybe it's a clap uh, routine that we do with our students. We also want to think about those attentional responses 
what the student is doing to show that they understand. And for some students, that might be an eye gaze. Um, for other students, that might be some kind of a movement that they make, but that we know what their responses look like and the cues that we are giving and we are consistent with those. You might be a teacher like me that says, look at me, look at me, look at me, but you might have a different attentional cue and you want to use that systematically. If you want some other ideas about attentional cues and attentional responses, check out the systematic instruction book um, by Dr. Belva Collins. You might also want to be thinking about the stimulus prompts that you're using to get students' attention and thinking about fading those as quickly as possible. And a great example of that is on word flashcards. I might start out with the word red being colored red, but over time I would fade all the color words to black so that I'm ensuring the students are reading the words and not just identifying the color that they see. We also want to think about the prompting levels that we're using. We definitely want errorless learning, but we want to make sure that we're giving students time to respond and that we have their attention before we start teaching, giving students the ability to say to us, I would love more of this, or I am all done with learning right now. I need a break. We know the power of data in the world of special education, and quite frankly, without data, it just didn't happen. We want to make sure that not only we're taking data, but we're taking the right types of data. So for example, just marking that a student got an answer correct really isn't going to help us as much as knowing the student got the answer correct after three partial prompts. So knowing not only the accuracy, but the prompting levels um, can be really crucial. We also want to really think about how we're collecting data and know that data can um, make a difference between a student gaining a skill for a few minutes <clears throat> or letting us know if the student has that skill over time. So mass trials are when we just simply ask the student for the same response over and over again with nothing else happening in between. So identifying the letter B over and over again. We might be doing spaced trials in our instruction, and that could simply be I have three students in my group, and so I ask Sam first, then Jana, and then Laura, and I go back to Sam. That would be a spaced trial. We definitely want to be doing distributed trials over activities and over the day, over the weeks, to make sure that students not only are gaining information in the short term, but that they're maintaining that learning. If you are not familiar with the concept of aided language simulation and you are supporting a student who uses some kind of an AAC device, I've linked in three fantastic videos to talk about ALS and how we can use that. I link them in here not only for you, but to share with any adults that support our students and family members so that they'll understand the power of using AAC across all settings. And also just a quick reminder that we want to make sure that we understand where the student is at their representational level when we're looking at their um, use of any kind of supports. And this is definitely important when we're thinking about explicit instruction and the content that we're teaching. So is our student at a representational level where they need to see the actual objects? Can they recognize those objects in photographs that look like the image, the actual object, or are they at the icon level, like the images that we see on the left? Or are they at a word level where they can see the word ball and know that that means the round red object that is sitting on the table? So make sure that you know where your student is and that you're working with the experts in your building to really support our students in moving across that continuum as it's possible. I also wanted to mention, as we're thinking about getting ready to teach any concept, that we really maximize the power of not only co-teaching, but co-treating. So anytime we can have more than two adults working together towards student mastery, that can be a phenomenal thing. And we wanna make sure we're maximizing the use of those adults. So for example, I might be providing explicit instruction in a letter sound, and another adult that's working with me is supporting that AAC and helping the student navigate through their proloquo by modeling for them. 
oh, we want to say, I like this. I like this. And they're pushing the buttons and helping the student. We might also have adults that are providing some behavior supports and reinforcements, offering up tokens or um, whatever the reinforcer is that's helping our students stay engaged. We might be doing some co-treating with our speech and language pathologists, our OTs and our PTs um, embedded within our lessons to make sure that we're really maximizing our students' learning and engagement time. So if at all possible and you have two adults in the room, think about how those two adults can be helping provide richer instruction for our students. And we know as we get ready to dive into explicit instruction that we're not just one trick ponies that have just one tool in our toolbox, but when we're using explicit instruction, we're also using a whole variety of other evidence-based practices to support student learning. So whether that's a first then or a first then next schedule, some visual supports, we might also on the bottom right have some kind of picture cards available so students can request breaks. Uh, we might be offering instructional choice and feedback. We might be using a high probability response sequence. If you are newer to um, working with students with moderate to severe disabilities, on our NKCES online website, we have tons of great behavior support instruction. Um, those are all two hour PDs. The CI3T website that's linked in also has all kinds of excellent resources on evidence-based strategies you can use to support students when you are trying to teach content. A quick reminder that it's important that we plan for instructional breaks, taking into account our students' ability to attend and their need for movement. We might be doing things like a AAC yoga class. Love that video. Has a great uh, AAC incorporated throughout. We might be doing like on the bottom left, some kind of go noodle activity. We might simply be taking a stretch break, um, getting some water, or we know that we've got planned times that we need to break because the student um, needs medication or a breathing treatment or therapy. And so we're gonna need to plan around those needs for breaks. For all of our students, we all benefit from some visual supports for instruction. Um, including picture schedules and visual timers that tell us how long the learning is going to occur. So make sure that you've got all of your tools out and ready. And if you need additional, <coughs> excuse me, information on any of those, I've linked to them in here on this slide. So now I know you're all saying, I want more now. Tell me more about explicit instruction and we will dive deeply into the topic um, in the second video, I'm going to pause and our first video will end so that you can also take a stretch break and go back, look through your notes and add specific ideas for your students um, based on what we chatted about in our overview.